If you want to be on the mailing list, you can send me a chat or uh, you can send me an email. My email is rwcook90 at gmail.com. Why don't I type that in the chat when we get underway here? <clears throat> Paul, you want to go ahead and unmute yourself? Everybody else is muted and waiting. All right, let me get the screen share working. And let me welcome everyone. I very much appreciate the chance to get back uh, in sync and be able to share with you um, this evening. It is my pleasure. Let's see. Let me make sure I got my screen sharing working first. Okay. We get uh, James Lucas' picture up on the on the screen. Yeah, him and yeah. And all right. I will move that to the slideshow and get that to uh, slideshow and start from the start okay james lucas is our presenter this evening and he has been with us for several preliminary sessions as a participant and i should warn those of you who are participants that every once in a while the call comes for you to present and in this case uh, we had a gap and and uh, jonathan neville came through with his co-author as a as a person to present and so we are fortunate tonight to have someone who is, well, well he, you know, he, he's, he's well-educated, has spent a lifetime uh, studying the Book of Mormon, and so um, he's an attorney who has lived in New York City most of his adult life, is now relocated to Utah, received his undergraduate degree from Brigham Young University and law degree from Columbia, and uh, he's spent time examining the principles to help people working towards Zion, and I noticed that he focused upon combining stewardship, consecration, and entrepreneurship. Most recently, he is co-authoring with Jonathan Neville on the book, which hasn't yet come out, I don't believe, Where Did the Book of Mormon Come From? A Neo-Orthodox View of the Book of Mormon's Origins, Translation, and Destiny. And so his presentation this evening on uh, restoring translation to the restoration will give us glimpses of the past, the present, and the future. Uh, in beginning the uh, prayer this evening, I'd like to make a, a comment about it because the pictures that I commonly associate with the prayer are in intended to have some meaning. And the first one tonight is simply a picture of uh, field notes from Nauvoo. And you can see the imprint of those tiny pieces of, of type on the left part of that page. And in the second uh, picture, you'll see some actual type with the imprints. And the third one, you'll see Deborah Higdon with the discovery showing that the site not only is a printing office, but also a residence. But that's just introductory comment. Let us pray. Eternal word, the thought behind existence, source and creator of all we sense or see. We bow in awe before you as finite creatures faced with the author of eternity. Yet you help us cope. You offer us hope. You include us in your eternal plan, telling us in no uncertain word that your purpose will be heard to bring about the eternal life of man. So we rejoice to hear your gentle voice and to bask in the sunshine with a, with a cool summer breeze confident that you care, your words comfort that you share, yet we know better than to celebrate in ease, for the tempest comes, the thunder thrums, your word has challenged crucial to translate, and we are creatures of fuss and war, perhaps rotten to the core, yet with some eternal value to contemplate. So tonight, before you we bow, acknowledging somehow that our destiny is in both yours and our hands. 
And we ask your blessing in our humble Zoom call confessing on James Lucas, our presenter, and on all our various demands. We recognize our weakness, probably with too little weakness. We're inclined toward self-serving complicity. And yet, given the translations we've heard of the promises of your word, we still have hope for eternity. Because of the blessings of your Son, Jesus the Christ, the Holy One. Amen. I stop sharing and we turn it over to James Lucas for his presentation, helping us to understand the word in its translation. James, the floor is yours. There, there am I unmuted? Very good. So hello to everyone. I have, uh, as Paul mentioned, participated in some of the prior uh, sessions of this group uh, after Jonathan Neville uh, introduced me to the group and uh, it's a fascinating group of folks. So I'm very interested to present our ideas to you and uh, to see uh, what you all think of them. Um, for uh, those of you who uh, were hoping to hear Steve Pinecker, Tell us why a uh, Protestant defends the Book of Mormon. I hope, Paul, that you'll keep after Steve and make sure that he does do that presentation because I was very much interested in hearing about it. Uh, so I'm sort of substituting for him, uh, but not to let him off the hook over the long term. <laughs> He's scheduling for I hope. 11. Okay. So, um, all right, now let's... Uh, do the screen share. Oops. Oops. There. Can everybody see my uh, little uh, PowerPoint here? No, Restoring not yet. translation to the restoration. Not, not yet. yet. All right. Uh, oh. How about now? Here we are. are we good? Yep. Okay. All right. So uh, this presentation is uh, based on, oh, there we go, a book that uh, Jonathan Neville and I have uh, just completed and uh, submitted to publishers. Um, its uh, title is, Where Did the Book of Mormon Come From? A Neo-Orthodox View of Its Origins, Translation, and Destiny. Uh, the book is a, a short book by um, academic standards, um, but, uh, we're told that that's supposed to be the modern trend for nonfiction is for books to be shorter. So we hope that that fits in with the uh, trend. Uh, nonetheless, in this uh, period of time that we're got uh, this evening, I'm certainly not going to try to present the entire book. So I apologize in advance for saying probably more off, more than once that uh, there's more detail and more discussion on a particular point in the book. But for this particular presentation, we're kind of um, going to jump to toward the end of the book, the last part of the book, um, and uh, where we present a new uh, model for how the Book of Mormon was translated. Uh, but uh, let's uh, do a little bit of background in order to get there. Obviously, um, the one of the seminal events in the entire restoration movement is the production and printing of the Book of Mormon. Um, and it's, it's, it, I, one cannot overstate the significance of the Book of Mormon to the restoration uh, movement. Um, in Joseph's time, you know, many people claim to have visions of Jesus. So uh, the uh, first vision uh, experience, uh, while uh, significant, uh, was, uh, you know, not out completely out of the ordinary in his time and place. What set Joseph apart was the fact that he began his ministry by producing a 500 plus, plus book uh, page book of new scripture. He became a translator before he became a preacher. And these two groups were very different in Joseph's day. Uh, uh, preachers were, you know, fairly common. Uh, translators, however, were a rarefied scholarly group you know, based at uh, seminaries or universities. Um, and I think uh, we sometimes forget because they did come close in time to each other, but nonetheless, the Book of Mormon came before the church was created. 
the Book of Mormon predates Mormonism. Um, and of course, in the early days of the Restoration, the Book of Mormon was central to the message of early Restoration missionaries. At least in the LDS Church, for a long time, our um, uh, missionary work have focused on, used on the first vision uh, as being the sort of initial um, uh, presentation of uh, the events in the history of the uh, church. But uh, in the early times of the Restoration Movement, uh, as many of you know, uh, the first vision was very little spoken of. The message that the missionaries carried to the world was the Book of Mormon, and the Book of Mormon used oh, to introduce weird. the restored gospel. Um, so we asked the question, where did the Book of Mormon come from? Uh, kind of a basic question, we think, and one which um, has become rather confused in recent times. Now, of course, the traditional uh, original explanation is that it was translated from uh, uh, plates of gold. Uh, this is Oliver Cowdery's uh, summary, uh, which he published in 1834 uh, uh, in the Messenger and Advocate. This is, uh, he published a series of letters essentially giving the first history, first attempt at giving a history of the restoration movement. And the first letter uh, has this uh, fairly well-known description of his experience acting as the primary scribe for the Book of Mormon, where um, he emphasizes that it was uh, uh, done by the inspiration of heaven and translated with the aid of a physical device, uh, which uh, he called the Yerman Thummim, or he said, as the Nephites would have said, interpreters. Now, the term Yerman Thummim is uh, perhaps sometimes confusing uh, because uh, uh, arguments have been made that the term was used to mean things other than the Nephite interpreters. Uh, we discussed that in the book. Uh, uh, but uh, so we're going to, I'm going to tend in this presentation to refer to the interpreters just so that uh, you're clear that the, uh, what I'm referring to is uh, these ancient objects that were placed in the box uh, with the uh, gold plates uh, that uh, was recovered by Joseph Smith under the direction of Moroni. So here's uh, an excerpt from the uh, Wentworth, what's known as the Wentworth letter from 1842, uh, where Joseph himself is giving a description of the coming forth of the Book of Mormon. So he describes the, the records were engraven on plates that had the appearance of gold and then he proceeds to say also that the uh, container contained a, with the records was found a curious instrument, instrument which the ancients called the Yerman Thummim, because uh, that had become a fairly common term by the time, but he's clearly referring to the Nephite interpreters that were included in the box with the gold plates, uh, which he described consisted of two transparent stones sent in a bow fastened to a breastplate and then he says, through the medium of the Yerman Thummim, I translated the record by the gift and power of God. So clearly uh, from the beginning, both Joseph and Oliver, who are the two primary witnesses of the, uh, uh, to the question of the translation of the Book of Mormon, uh, indicated that it was done by the gift and power of God, but it, it was done with the assistance of this instrument which came to be called the German Thummim and which the Nephi, uh, as Oliver pointed out, was referred to as the interpreters in the Book of Mormon. So this, uh, uh, I love this, uh, this old lith this lithograph comes from a book that was published in 1893. Um, and uh, we can see this is basically giving us the traditional uh, explanation which Joseph and Oliver gave that the Book of Mormon, you see Joseph there is holding the gold plates and then Moroni is handing him the uh, Yerman Thummim, uh, which in this uh, 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 picture is, uh, looks like a pair of spectacles, which people did compare it to, we'll, we'll get into that. But clearly this is the uh, traditional explanation. 
and we would emphasize, I'd emphasize that Joseph and Oliver were consistent throughout their lives in a number of different accounts. We have an appendix in our book where we collect all of Joseph and Oliver's accounts, but they were consistent in saying that the translation process uh, used the plates and the interpreters uh, to produce the text of the Book of Mormon that we have. Now, of course, uh, so that's sort of, I would consider the base explanation of the uh, 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 coming forth of Book of Mormon, but of course there are other theories. Now, obviously from the beginning, uh, people were arguing uh, uh, for composition uh, that, you know, this doesn't come from gold plates or uh, special interpreter instruments. This is just something that uh, uh, was being dictated to uh, Joseph's scribes. Everyone, no one really disputes that the process was that Joseph was dictating the text to a, a series of scribes, the primary of which was Oliver Cowdery. Uh, but it's important for what we're going to discuss here to remember that while today uh, the most common secular explanation is that Joseph Smith was the creator of the text, uh, that in the 1800s the predominant theory was that Joseph uh, did not uh, himself create the text, but rather was uh, copying it from uh, reading it off of a manuscript by uh, a man named Solomon Spaulding, uh, who had passed away by the time these events occurred, uh, but that Sidney Rigdon had got hold of Solomon Spaulding's manuscript, uh, kind of revised it to make it a little more religious or Christian, and secretly sent it to Joseph Smith uh, to serve as the basis for the Book of Mormon. Uh, so the, uh, it's important to, uh, just for the context, to remember that in the 1800s, that was the predominantly accepted uh, secular theory uh, although today in our, in our time in the 20th and 21st centuries, uh, most secular explanations assume that Joseph uh, himself made up the text. So that's obviously uh, one of the explanations which we have to uh, you know, account for and uh, so forth. In more recent years, we kind of have seen a third explanation emerge. Now, um, we call this transcription, it's the seer stone in the hat, which uh, we uh, uh, basically is, there were accounts from the you know, very beginning that said that um, no, Joseph did not use or did not mostly use this Urim and Thummim that had come with the plates or even the gold plates for that matter, but rather that the translation process, he used a seer stone, which he had found in his treasure digging days. Uh, he would put it in a hat, uh, cover his face with the, or stick his face down into the hat with the seer stone in it and recite the Book of Mormon text to the scribes. Um, this is uh, uh, on the uh, right is a, one person's illustration of what this process was. Uh, it, in this particular illustration, the blanket is up that was said to have separated Joseph from his scribes, although other Searstone accounts claim that there was no blanket or separation so that other people could see Joseph uh, looking at the, his uh, Searstone in the hat. On the left is a picture of a uh, Searstone, which, uh, or stone, which, uh, was uh, said to be the main seer stone that Joseph used. Uh, he, uh, there's a kind of torturous chain of custody, but there is a chain of custody back to Joseph. This was given to uh, Oliver Cowdery. Oliver Cowdery gave it to Phineas Young before his death, uh, who was a brother of Brigham Young. Uh, Phineas took it to Utah. It, uh, anyway, it got into the hands of Brigham Young, and then Brigham left it to one of his wives, and one of his wives left it to the LDS Church. And I'm probably missing a couple of steps there too. But at least there's a you know there's a there's a reasonable claim for a chain of custody of this instrument back of this stone uh, back to uh, uh, Joseph, and uh, it was and is now preserved in the LDS Church archives and was kept. Uh, unhidden or was not displayed for decades and decades and decades, but finally in 2015, uh, it was brought out of uh, the archives and graphs were made available of it.
So anyway, that's the stone in the hat, uh, which really constitutes a uh, kind of a third version of uh, how the Book of Mormon came about. Now, um, as I said, these accounts are um, uh, go back uh, to fairly early times, uh, or at least let's put it this way, the people who are looked to as the source of the Sears Stone in the Hat accounts um, are, um, you know, original members of the church. People claim uh, quotes, you know, to cite uh, Emma Smith and Martin Harris, who both served as scribes, David Whitmer, who was not a scribe, but who obviously was around from early days, and uh, various other people as sources for uh, claiming that Joseph uh, mainly used his seer stone in his hat rather than the plates and the uh, uh, Urim and Thummim for the translation. Um, we in the book, now I'm not going to spend focus on this because we have two chapters in the book on this, but what we, uh, Jonathan and I have done is we went back and looked in detail at the primary seer stone accounts that are used. These are from Emma Smith, Martin Harris, and David Whitmer. Um, and um, basically, uh, and I'm going to kind of, uh, you know, this is just a teaser for the book. Uh, we really dug into them. We looked at them in context. We researched them. Uh, we researched the broader context in which those, the various statements were made. And uh, we came to the conclusion that they were inconsistent and unreliable as historical sources. And that's all detailed in the book. Uh, now, they don't, we do not contend that they don't exist. We agree that these accounts do appear in the historical record. So, you know, obviously then if we're going to say, but, you know, discount them and ignore them because they're not accurate and they aren't reliable, we have to explain why they appear in the historical record. So we present in the book what um, we call the demonstration hypothesis. Uh, Zenus H. Gurley was, or Zenus, because there was a genius, Zenus Gurley Sr. also, but Zenus Gurley Jr. was an apostle of what was then the uh, reorganized church. Um, and uh, during his, uh, he undertook a detailed survey in the 1870s of everything that he could find out about the origins of the Book of Mormon, which included interviewing uh, John and David Whitmer, uh, who were the only surviving witnesses, uh, researching in the records, uh, and, and, uh, and generally doing a, a, a very thorough survey of everything that he could find at that time that bore on the question of the origins of the Book of Mormon. And he published it. Um, and in uh, his report that he published in a journal called Autumn Leaves, which I was not familiar with, but it was apparently a uh, youth journal of the uh, reorganized church, um, he, we get this quote, he describes how um, Joseph also, he, he was talking about, to put this in context, he was talking about the seer stone and, uh, and uh, or the Urim and Thummim. And then he says that Joseph had another seer stone called a seer stone or peep stone is certain. This stone was frequently exhibited to different ones in order to assuage their awful curiosity. And uh, we love that phrase, their awful curiosity. Uh, but he says the Yerman Thummim never, except possibly to Oliver Cowdery. So our, and we have other evidence that um, uh, there are other sources that would indicate that Joseph would sometimes pull out a seer stone to try to explain to people kind of how the Book of Mormon translation process was being performed uh, because he could not show them the gold plates or the Yerman Thummim. Uh, Moroni had specifically prohibited him from showing this to any unauthorized person. Uh, and until the uh, uh, eight and three witness experiences, the only person who possibly was authorized to see it besides Joseph was Oliver Cowdery, as uh, Gurley indicates. So we, um, our theory is that, uh, you know, we can, uh, you can appreciate how early uh, people interested in the restoration would be extremely curious where this, you know, these, these gold plates were and how they were this record of the Book of Mormon, where it was coming from. I mean, I would be curious about that if I were around and, and attracted to this uh, early uh, 
a religious movement and uh, the early saints were as well. And um, so <clears throat> we believe Joseph would whip out his little uh, peep stone that he picked up uh, and liked to carry around with him, kind of as, I like to refer to it as his pet rock um, and say, well, it's kind of like this, he put in his hat. So it's kind of like this, I, you know, I have these stones and I read off of it uh, to the, uh, and in fact, there's one newspaper account, uh, which is much more detailed from David Whitmer, uh, describing a, a formal session at the Whitmer home, uh, where Joseph actually uh, uh, seems to have performed such a demonstration. Uh, so anyway, that's our, our explanation as to where the Sears stone account come from. But what's interesting about them is that um, mainly, although there are, the, they come from people who were around at the pre, you know, at the beginning, the counts themselves, for the most part, don't appear until the 1870s and 1880s. And so, our argument, which we make much more elaborately in the book, is that what these were were basically ap apologetic attempts to refute the uh, Spalding theory, because if you could say, "Oh no, Joseph wasn't hidden." I saw him with his face in his hat and his peepstone in his hat, translating the Book of Mormon. That refutes the Spalding theory, which says that he was hiding behind the blanket, uh, the veil in the from the first major anti-Mormon book, Mormon is unveiled. Um, and so he wasn't, you know, looking at a manuscript like the Spalding theory says. So that was a, a way of refuting the Spalding theory. But unfortunately. To do so, they had to wildly inflate these few incidents where Joseph had made a demonstration um, to, uh, and it sort of consumed the major account, uh, which Joseph and Oliver gave, which said that the bulk, the vast majority of the translation was done using the gold plates and the Urim and Thummim. Or as uh, Joseph Smith III said, uh, uh, he wrote an excellent article about this where he repudiated the Sears Stone account. And he said, well, if there was a Sears Stone, there's still no doubt that the chief instrument, that's Joseph III's uh, uh, term that he used, that the chief instrument of the translation was the Yermim Thummim interpreters. And uh, so we have that uh, excellent article uh, by Joseph III on that subject. Uh, we cite that in the book. So um, it, nonetheless, uh, the seer stone in the hat, which we call the Sith theory <laughs> for stone in the hat, um, has become uh, uh, garnered widespread acceptance in the uh, scholarly community of Mormon uh, historians. So um, if you accept the seer stone in the hat as being the main method by which the Book of Mormon is produced, the next question is uh, if it wasn't from the plates, the gold plates, where did the Book of Mormon come from? So um, two prior, now I'm going to be summarizing other people's work that I don't agree with. So I acknowledge up front that I may be, uh, you know, not presenting these arguments in the way that their advocates would present them. And I'm, you know, hopefully, you know, when our book comes out, I'm sure people will make comments about our, in our, our uh, uh, presentation of, uh, uh, of the theories that we don't agree with. But for purposes of this demonstration, we've got to uh, kind of summarize, or this presentation, we have to summarize a little bit. So uh, as we see it, they kind of fall into two categories. Once you cut yourself off from the gold plates, and said the gold plates are not what the Book of Mormon comes from, uh, you um, kind of have uh, the theories have gone in two opposite directions. Um, one theory basically says that uh, Joseph uh, was getting uh, the, uh, a text, but uh, he was getting a word for word text from a pre existing translation. Um, which he received either through looking at the seer stone or by some form of direct revelation. Um, and so that Joseph really was not the translator of the Book of Mormon, but rather was working off of some pre- Nobody really is, uh, knows 
or uh, who this this translate who was the real translator of the Book of Mormon, we kind of and, and this may not be polite, but we we've coined the term mist mysterious incognito supernatural translator to describe who it was that really did interpret the Book of Mormon. Uh, one of the most recent theories that I've seen from these folks is that it was the three Nephites who in the 1500s traveled to England, learned early modern English, did a translation of the Book of Mormon, which they then took back to America and then gave to put in the box and gave or uh, gave to Joseph Smith in some way, uh, uh, leaving intact the early modern English version of it. Um, I don't know, that's, that's one explanation that they offer, which has far more issues with it than it solves. Now, the other approach is um, to say that, uh, no, you know, Joseph was in fact the person who produced the text of the Book of Mormon, um, and, but it was inspired. Uh, and the way that it came to him was through uh, visions and general impressions. In other words, uh, he, uh, he didn't really get a specific text uh, of any sort, because of course, this is still assuming he's just looking at his seer stone in the hat and not looking at the gold plates anymore. And he would, uh, so this version basically says uh, that, you know, he'd get these visions and, and inspirations, and then he would spontaneously produce, you know, as, as best he could, a, a, a verbal description of these uh, visions and impressions he was getting, which he would then dictate to his scribe. So uh, again, this may not, uh, you know, we use the term shamanist to describe these approaches, uh, which again may be a term that the people who advocate these approaches would not appreciate, but we've got to have some kind of a shorthand. So um, anyway, so you get these are approaches that uh, believers in the Book of Mormon, people who believe that it is the word of God have come up with to explain where Joseph got the text of the Book of Mormon from, uh, even though he was uh, not using the gold plates or the uh, Nephite interpreters that came with the gold plates. So uh, let's, uh, okay, not too bad on time. So uh, let's start with the shamanist explanations. These are the explanations that say the Book of Mormons came in visions and, uh, and uh, you know, panoramic views of Nephite uh, civilization. Uh, that Joseph then dictated in his own language as best he could uh, from these experiences. So the first problem with these explanations is that the Book of Mormon is incredibly complex and precise narrative. And it's just hard to believe that anyone could track that kind of narrative over 500 plus pages, even with the benefit of inspiration, if one was just receiving kind of generalized visions uh, of, uh, of uh, the Book of Mormon events. You know, it contains over 200 named individuals, including family connections. There's 26 different record keepers who are mentioned. If you go to uh, uh, the uh, uh, Jaredite record, there's a, um, uh, a, a royal lineage, a genealogy with 41 kings, including rival lines, all of which are kept very are, are, you know, the Book of Mormon keeps very careful track of these royal lineages. There's different chronologies, you know, it's the time since the time of Lehi, since the reign of the rule of judges, since the coming of Christ, which seemed their fit very neatly over a thousand year period. There's a convoluted geography with over a hundred named locations, which those who follow, uh, you know, study geography Everyone agrees that the internal map is consistent. These all these different locations, uh, uh, although you know we have to acknowledge that uh, there's not agreement on it being mapped onto a real world setting. But at least internally, this convoluted geography is very consistent. So that'd be just hard to imagine that if you're just receiving kind of generalized visions, um, that you could keep this kind of in detail. Uh, keep track of this kind of detail over 500 plus pages. Not only uh, is there this kind of narrative detail, but uh, the Book of Mormon contains precise and varied literary forms. And I'm not just talking about chiasmus. 
but I'm talking about uh, poetic structures, the organization, you know, people have written books, uh, which we again cite in, in more detail in our book, uh, detailing the parallelisms and the, and the literary forms uh, and the uh, structures that uh, appear in the book. And of course, there's also a very uh, elaborate uh, uh, body of work uh, that identifies Hebraisms and other linguistic artifacts in the text, in English text. Um, and uh, of course, uh, and then above all, there's this overarching and elaborate epic structure. And the Book of Mormon is an epic. Um, we, uh, you know, we invoke uh, Richard Wagner, we invoke J.R.R. Tolkien in the book to try to give a sense of the, uh, of, of, uh, that the uh, Book of Mormon as a whole tracks the traditional narrative structure of an epic, of a national epic. Um, and again, work has been done on that that we, we cite. So again, that would be hard to just track that if you're just kind of spinning words off uh, because you're having some generalized vision. Um, and then finally, the last difficulty with this uh, approach is that there are many witness statements. They have, uh, you know, they have their issues. You know, nobody ever said, I looked through the, either the Nephite interpreters or at the seer stone in the hat to be able to say, oh, I, this is what I saw. Joseph was the only one, whichever instrument you believe he used to actually look at it. But nonetheless, there's lots of people who gave various accounts of how the Book of Mormon was uh, uh, translated. <clears throat> and despite the, the differences between them, one thing they all agreed on is that everyone understood that Joseph was receiving a text in English. That, that's one thing that regardless of, you know, were they getting explanations from Joseph? Some said, Joseph told me that this is how it worked. So, and those people, and, but everybody understood that what Joseph was getting was not, you know, some generalized vision, but he was getting something in English that he was translating. And that of course would contradict uh, the shamanistic explanation. Okay, so the difficulties of the mist explanation. This is the um, mysterious incognito supernatural translator. In other words, Joseph wasn't actually being a translator. He was just reciting a text that he was getting either from the seer stone or through some kind of direct revelation, but it was word for word. He was getting word for word what the Book of Mormon should be. And he really had no intellectual input into it. He was basically, it was a double team of transcribers. Joseph would just read a word for word text uh, off of however he was receiving it and the scribe would write it down. And uh, neither one of them had anything really uh, input into what the, was in the text. So the first difficulty with this explanation is that it's clear that the Book of Mormon's language is from Joseph's world. Um, now, a lot of people have made this argument, a lot of composition advocates who say, you know, Joseph Smith wrote the Book of Mormon, have done elaborate work over many decades, showing all the connections between Joseph's world and the text of the Book of Mormon. But uh, we've, uh, I, I think, uh, so my colleague, Jonathan Neville, and I think he may has, has discussed this in some of his previous presentations, has now posted online what we call the non-biblical intertextuality database, uh, which is basically what he did was he took all of the non-biblical uh, language and phrases in the Book of Mormon, and then he's uh, uh, scoured the um, things that would have realistically been available to Joseph Smith. And he has been able to match up just about everything in the Book of Mormon with some source that was available to Joseph Smith. Uh, now, obviously, the thing uh, that now this includes many things: family, uh, you know, language, you know, how did you know we have a book from Lucy uh, Smith, and you know uh, that was dictated by her. So that kind of gives you a sense of how the Smith family, what their language was like. Uh, the local newspapers. Uh, Jonathan scoured the Palmyra Register and other newspapers to see how you know a local newspaper was written. Uh, popular books uh, like the late war and so forth that were in Joseph's immediate environment. 
And of course, um, one of the, the surprise discovery of this research, which Jonathan has reported on to this group before, was discovery that much of this language in the Book of Mormon corresponds to language from Jonathan Edwards. And uh, of course, Jonathan has written another book all about that. But unless this is, uh, he's now posted this bad database, which is now 1500, 1600 pages. He's always playing with it and updating it. Uh, but that's now online for everyone to look at. So basically, um, the Book of Mormon, uh, we can trace all of its language to Joseph Smith's environment. So there's really, you know, the contention that it was actually written in the 1500s or written by some other translator uh, is uh, hard to maintain when, in fact, the, all the book's language and vocabulary and lexicon can be traced to Joseph Smith's immediate environment. Um, okay, there are, um, uh, let's see, uh, another problem with these accounts about a very tightly controlled translation is that, again, while they come from or are attributed to a lot of people who uh, were there from the beginning, like Martin Harris and David Whitmer, uh, most of the actual sources that where it's written down, again, come from much late. They're very late. They come from the 1870s and 1880s. And often they're posthumous, you know, especially Emma Smith and Martin Harris. Uh, the, uh, everything that both uh, people cite from them are from posthumous accounts that uh, were published not until after they had died. Um, and uh, interestingly, a lot of these accounts are come also with uh, in the same context as the Searstone accounts. And uh, so we uh, concluded that uh, these, this aspect of these late accounts are again, exaggerated, distorted, unreliable, but you know, we need to acknowledge that the folks who brought these forward, such as David Whitmer, you know, were doing so sincerely as defenders of the Book of Mormon to rebut the Spalding theory. But basically, they they got a they, they let their you know their uh, apologetic efforts have run away with them, and it resulted in distorted and unreliable accounts. And uh, particularly with regard to this explanation, everyone no matter whether they're Sistone, whether they let, you know, broke with Joseph or stayed with Joseph or whatever, no one that we have found has ever suggested that there was any translator other than Joseph. So this is just really an explanation that is uh, uh, in that, on that point is uh, devoid of any kind of historical, you know, the Sirstone accounts are there. So, you know, we have to acknowledge those, but there's simply no one who ever suggested the idea that anybody understood that uh, you know there was anybody other than Joseph uh, sourcing being the source of this book. Um, uh, other points are that uh, uh, the uh, <clears throat> uh, tight translation uh, exposes the book warm into criticisms such as uh, anachronisms and use of King James language which can be explained if Joseph was instead an actively engaged translator. You know, when you're a translator and you're actively translating, you've got to translate the lang into the language that you know. So why would it be surprising that the language in the Book of Mormon can be found in Joseph's environment? What other language would Joseph know, have available to him to translate it into uh, if he was acting as a genuine uh, translator? Um, and then finally, uh, you have the point that, well, there, there's a big point to come on the next page, but uh, then Joseph himself made hundreds of train changes in the 18, 1837 and 1840 editions of the Book of Mormon. Uh, some of the type of which Paul may have discovered in his researches, uh, recent excavations. Um, you know, if this was dictated word for word from God, why on earth would Joseph be justified in making so many changes uh, to subsequent editions. And while many of the changes were just grammatical cleanup, there were substantive changes also, as critics of the Book of Mormon have pointed out many times. So that's hard to square with the idea that this was a, 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 a text given word for word from God. Probably though the biggest problem with the, uh, these explanations is the, it contradicts the scripture. We do have a scripture, a revelation, 
which is in both section nine of both the LDS and Community of Christ uh, Doctrine and Covenants. Uh, it was a revelation received very early. This was the revelation when Oliver was authorized to try to undertake translating himself, and he wasn't able to do it. And so then this revelation was given, which uh, is a, a very uh, highly regarded revelation, at least I know in the LDS church, because it kind of is, uh, gives some instruction on how one receives revelation. And uh, it uh, says this uh, in, the, in the community of Christ, it's a single verse, but in this is the versification from the LDS version. The uh, Lord says to Oliver, you thought that all you had to do was ask me, but you had to study it out in your mind and then ask me if it be right. And if it's right, I will cause your bosom to burn within you. If it's not right, shall have no such feelings, but shall have a stupor of thought. And so clearly um, the revelation says that there must be some kind of intellectual activity on the translator's part uh, in order to translate the Book of Mormon. Okay, and another final problem, uh, whoops, I'm gonna rush ahead here, um, is that uh, a lot of people talk about how fast the Book of Mormon was produced, but when you actually look at it, it was actually slow. If you take the Book of Mormon, and uh, let's take the traditional 75-day timeline, and you sat down and have one person read out the Book of Mormon, another person write it out longhand, uh, you can get through the Book of Mormon easily in, uh, you know, uh, in a very short period of time. You can write out 10, 20 pages a day, and in just a few hours. It's really not, if you're just dictating straight out, it's really not uh, an, 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 uh, an overwhelming task. Um, and yet we have this quote from David Whitmer, who although we question a lot of what David said, when he's a firsthand witness, we're willing to accept it. And he was around the house when Joseph and Oliver were dictating uh, the first part of the Book of Mormon, you know, First Nephi through uh, Words of Mormon. And uh, uh, he told uh, E.C. Briggs, uh, who uh, uh, published this account in the Saints Herald in 1884, the boys, now of course, Joseph, this is 1884, so David's in his 80s, so he's looking back, although they were all about the same age, um, worked long and hard early and late while translating the plates. It was a slow work, and they could only write a few pages a day. So if, um, uh, so if this is uh, something that you're just reading off a dictation from some other translation that somebody else has written, uh, where on earth would it take so long to produce such a dictation? This implies that there again was some kind of major work being done to produce the Book of Mormon. Okay, so we now reach the dilemma point. What on earth are we going to do with to explain how the Book of Mormon was produced? So I would like to introduce you all to a new character who has not been previously uh, cited in Book of Mormon studies or in Mormon studies at all. This is the Reverend Dr. Eugene A. Nida. Uh, Reverend Nida uh, was the Secretary General of the American Bible Society for over 40 years. He oversaw hundreds of Bible translations. In addition to having a PhD in linguistics from the University of Michigan, he was an ordained uh, Baptist minister. And he, uh, but most importantly, for our purposes, he developed theories and approaches to translation, which not only have universally impact Bible translation in our time, he is the giant, he is the dean of Bible translation in our time, but his views have carried over into all translation work. You go into any kind of translation scholarship and uh, Re uh, Eugene Nida's uh, concepts are found. He was a, a towering figure in the field of translation studies uh, uh, up until his death in 2011 in, at the age of 96. So I'm now going to grossly summarize Eugene Nida's theories, um, but this is kind of some basic concepts which we will now use to, we will apply to the Book of Mormon. So uh, Reverend Nida saw translation as being a continuum between kind of two, two poles, if you will. But it's, these are not binaries. These are just, this is a continuum. You have what he called formal equivalents. 
These are literalistic translations which adhere faithfully to the source text in phrasing and even grammar. So when you're, uh, and this was the traditional approach to Bible translation. Uh, this is why the King James Version seems awkward to us. Um, and a lot of people think, well, that's because I don't know 1600s English. But actually, uh, one of the major problems that uh, you have in understanding the King James Version is that the King James translators deliberately track the Hebrew and Greek very closely because that they felt was the way, most authentic way to do the translation. So um, it's not just the 1600s English, it's the fact that they are, we're adhering very closely to the Greek and Hebrew um, language and so forth. Um, so that's, but it's, it's um, the argument is, is that if I'm translating this text, I wanna be as close to the text as possible so I'm going to, I, you obviously can't do it word for word because that produces something that's incoherent, but I'm going to try to get as close as I can uh, in, uh, uh, to the original uh, while still producing something that's grammatically coherent in my uh, language that I'm translating the, into. So uh, Reverend Nida introduced a concept which was originally called dynamic equivalence, but he later preferred the term functional equivalence. And that's where he said, the task of the translator is not to translate words. The task of a translator is to translate meaning. So therefore, don't worry about how it was phrased in the original language. You need to put your text, and of course, in most cases, originally, when he developed his theory, he was talking about translating the Bible. So this is very, uh, you know, a very serious uh, trans translation task. He said, you need to phrase it in a way that's going to mean something to what the target audience. He liked the term receptor audience. And it doesn't matter if, um, you know, the Greek or the Hebrew said this or that. You need to understand what that meant in the Greek or the Hebrew. And you've got to restate it in the receptor language in a way that people will recognize as being their language. And uh, if that means that you've got to wander away from the Greek and the Hebrew, fine, you do that. Your job is to translate meaning, not words. So this is functional equivalence. And, and it's not a, like I said, it's not a binary, it's a, it's a continuum. So um, now we applied uh, Reverend Nida's uh, framework um, to the Book of Mormon. Now this, uh, this could be very controversial, but we see uh, four basic characteristics of the Book of Mormon text. One is that the language does come from Joseph's environment. Uh, second, there's a substrata underlying all this 1820s American English. There are lots of ancient art, uh, language artifacts. There are Hebraisms, there are, um, uh, you know, uh, phrases and, and so forth that have ancient uh, connections. Uh, Three was this complex narrative and structure, which I was describing before, uh, where there's extremely detailed, extremely precise uh, structure uh, to the Book of Mormon. Um, and finally, I, you know, it's just, it uses the King James Version of the Bible. It's clear that, that Joseph was tracking the King James Version of the Bible uh, in the sections of the, not in two ways, one in the sections where it overlaps the Bible he clearly, uh, he, he was following the King James uh, uh, version. And secondly, obviously the style of the Book of Mormon, even when it's not a direct uh, quote from the Bible, is very much in the King James style or an attempt to imitate the King James style. So if we analyze our theories that we've been coming up with um, against uh, these, um, these characteristics, uh, I, we would argue that all of them come up short. So uh, these are all the stone in the, can in the hat account. So composition, obviously people will say, well, Joseph Smith just wrote it, are in the comp they're in the stone in the hat account. They all accept that uh, Joseph was looking at a stone in his hat. So they have to be counted in with the uh, shamanist and the uh, mist uh, advocates who do believe the Book of Mormon. Uh, so the language from Joseph's environment, 
composition people can account for that. The shamanist uh, people, they are saying, well, Joseph had to make up, you know, describe the visions he was having in his own language, so that's okay, but it completely contradicts. The mist account can't account for that at all. Ancient language artifacts, now here, the uh, composition and shamanists, they can't account for that. Why these ancient Hebrew forms would be underlying the English text. Uh, the missed account can because you know it's it's a, a word for word translation. The complex narrative here again, the composition and the shamanist cannot you know so they're assuming that Joseph is basically just spinning this out uh, off the top of his head. Uh, they can't account for that. Uh, the missed account can. However, when we get back to the King James Bible, um, while composition people can account for it by saying that uh, Joseph was just looking, copying the King James Bible, neither the shamanist or the missed accounts can account for uh, the fact that the King James Bible was being used. So we would argue, and I know the advocates of these views will uh, you know, get very upset at this summary dismissal of their theories, and I'm sure we'll hear a lot about that when our book comes up. But nonetheless, we feel that all the Stone and Cat accounts fail in one way or another to account for the Book of Mormon text. Okay, we're gonna get done here in just a few minutes. Okay, so uh, this part I'm gonna kind of skip through real quickly. Uh, so now let us go back to the plates and the interpreters, the original Joseph Smith and Oliver Cowdery explanation about the, where the text come from. Um, so let's ask, talk a little bit more of the interpreters. Um, the, uh, they were compared to spectacles or old fashioned eyeglasses by people who saw them, but uh, they weren't exactly like spectacles. David Whitmer said that they were much larger than spectacles. Uh, Martin Harris said that the stones were translucent rather than transparent. So they were clearly not exactly like spectacles, even though that's how they were often portrayed. This is the best illustration I could find of uh, the descriptions of the Yerman Thummim, but even this has its problems. Uh, okay, so uh, real quick, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm running over my time here, but um, so let's just, uh, this is a quick thought experience. Let's, let's think of a device. It's handheld, has visual displays. It can be used to scan characters and translate characters from other language and display their meanings in the user's language. Uh, it will also provide transliterations of uh, unknown words and has other communication and information display capabilities. That's a device, I'm, I'm describing a device. Now, what does that describe? It describes both the Yerman Thummim and a modern cell phone. So in uh, 1830, both the, Yerm, uh, the, the interpreters and the seer stone seem fantastical. And we would argue that today, the Yerman Thummim interpreters as they are described are actually completely plausible. Now, there are some differences that uh, we go into in the book between uh, what the Yerman Thummim could do and that even our modern technology is not capable of. But we would argue that the uh, interpreters um, basically are completely, uh, the way they're described, their functionality is described, is quite plausible in our modern society, as bizarre as they may have seemed to people in the time of Joseph Smith. Uh, so we cite uh, Arthur C. Clarke, the famous science fiction uh, author's uh, third law, any sufficiently advanced technology we will be indistinguishable from magic. So in the uh, 1830s, uh, it seemed when they described the interpreters that it was folk magic. That was the closest they could think was the seer stones that people, practitioners of folk magic were involved with. But we would argue that this is an application, an example of Arthur C. Clarke's third law. It seemed like magic to the people in the 1830s, but all it really is, the Yerman Thummim really is, is an incredibly advanced technology. Okay, one, give me two more minutes, and I will now tell you how the Book of Mormon was translated. So our new theory of the Book of Mormon translation is this. 
we believe that it was based on the interpreters and the um, uh, gold plates. Joseph was working, like he and Oliver said, from the gold plates using the Yerman Thumma. He, uh, we have accounts that Oliver gave where he said that Joseph scanned over the gold plates with the interpreters. That was how it worked, which is very much how you might well do it if you're using a, a, a technological device today. We uh, propose that what the interpreters gave Joseph was a formal equivalent version of the Nephite text in English. In other words, something that was very literalistic, very close to being word for word. Joseph then had to study out in his mind how to render a functionally equivalent presentation into contemporary English of the meaning of the literalistic formal equivalent language that the interpreters were giving him. And this is just a speculation, but we could imagine him maybe using Oliver as a sounding board as he was trying to uh, figure out how to express this in the English of their time. Having studied it out in his mind, he would then seek spiritual confirmation of the proposed functionally equivalent rendering of the, into the receptor language, which was the American English of the 1820s. And then guided by the Holy Spirit, as it says in Doctrine and Covenants 9, he would then have the text written by the scribe or he'd revise it. Now, so uh, this, I'll, I'll skip through this. You, uh, a lot of you are familiar with the task of translation. So a translator has to do lots of things. He has to deal with colloquialisms, metaphors. He has to decide if you're being a functionally uh, equivalent translator like Reverend Nida advocated, you have to think of the social context of the receptor audience, think how it would be received by the receptor audience. Uh, you have to uh, figure out if you maybe need to elaborate or expand on the text in order to convey a correct meaning to the receptor audience. And you have to choose a style and a tone that the receptor audience will respect, which is, we will argue, and this is much more elaborated in the book, uh, explains why the King James Bible and was used and rhetoric from Jonathan Edwards, because this was that was very high prestige uh, language which, and this was the word of God. So Joseph was trying to use the most prestigious kinds of language that he knew. Um, and of course, there are variations uh, by the uh, uh, inspiration. Now, this is a very complicated process. Why this complicated process? I'm really one minute away from ending. So we go back to Reverend Nida. Uh, Reverend Nida said that translators do not translate language, but texts. The essential skill of translators is being able to understand correctly the meaning of a source text. So um, taking our lead from Reverend Nida, uh, oh, so this is uh, uh, perhaps the heart of our theory, uh, which is that Joseph had a defect as a translator, which is that he didn't know Nephi. So by having a literalistic version of the rendering of the uh, Nephi uh, provided to him by the interpreters, this enabled him to bridge that gap, that shortcoming, by giving him the closest possible sense of what the Nephite authors were saying in their own voices. When you're reading something that's very literalistic, very formal equivalent, you get a feel for what Nephi was really saying, what Mormon was really saying. And then having that and, and the understanding of what the original authors were, were saying in as, as close to their own voices as possible, then you can study it out in your mind and with the aid of the Holy Spirit, come up with a way of expressing it in your own language, uh, the receptor language. So if we uh, go back to our four characteristics, we believe this approach accounts for the way the Book of Mormon is. Uh, there's language from Joseph's environment as uh, an actively engaged translator, Joseph would use his own vocabulary and environment to produce a functionally equivalent text, which his receptor audience could relate to. However, uh, when it comes to ancient, ancient language artifacts, because he was getting from the interpreters a rather literal formal equivalent and base language forms from the original text would, would tend to flow through into the translated text. The complex narrative and structure 
because he was translating from the plates and because the authors of the plates had much more time to organize the text and create elaborate uh, narrative structures and so forth. The, uh, this uh, using the interpreters would assure the preservation in, of the detail and structure that was put in place by the original authors. And finally, the use of the King James Bible. Uh, Reverend Nida was very adamant that in producing a functionally equivalent translation, in other words, one that had meaning for the receptor audience, one had to respect the existing scriptural heritage of the receptor audience. And as I'm sure you know, in 1820s America, the King James Bible had vast, vast prestige. And uh, that, so that was why Joseph had to use the King James Version uh, because basically the people of his receptor audience in the 1830s wouldn't have accepted the Book of Mormon if it didn't track the King James Version where there was uh, overlap. And we have some a lot of discussion about that and some great uh, stuff about that. So to conclude, uh, you know, uh, here's a quote from uh, uh, Richard Bushman, uh, which says that translators, you know, we can't cover everything. What a translator has to do is form the facts as best they can to best account for the facts and form them into a convincing story. So we're not arguing that this is absolutely the final definitive answer. We present this as a useful working hypothesis. Uh, which we believe ex better explains the text of the Book of Mormon and the way why it is the way it is than other explanations, but we acknowledge that the record is complex. Now, uh, our hypothesis is not naturalistic. Uh, a couple of people who we described it to say, well, that's a naturalistic explanation. But, uh, you know, we still have plenty of, uh, of uh, mystery and religion in our we accept the historicity of the Book of Mormon. We accept that the plates and the interpreters were real. And we accept that there were guidance of angels and the Holy Spirit throughout the process. However, to conclude, by framing the origins of the, in, of the Book of Mormon in terms of technology and personal revelation, which we believe that uh, Latter-day Saint uh, believers can relate to, uh, we hope that this would make the Book of Mormon more approachable uh, uh, and relatable to a tech-drenched 21st century receptor audience. Um, and so we uh, will be presenting this in our book as a new way of looking at the uh, translation of the Book of Mormon. And oops, I'm only over by a few minutes, I apologize. But that's uh, a quick summary of some of the points that we make in our book, all of which are you know, laid out in much more elaboration in, in, in the book. Well, thank you, Brother Lucas, for that uh, presentation. I am intrigued that uh, we have need then, if I understand you correctly, to be translating the text again for a new generation of people that haven't come to, gri to grips with it yet. Well, I'm not, we're not saying, well, there's a famous uh, quote, well, not famous quote, but it's, a, it's become a kind of well-known quote from Brigham Young, who in 1862 told a, an audience that um, if the Book of Mormon were translated today, he's talking in 1862, uh, we're, I'm sure it would read very differently than it did back then in 1830, when it was originally translated. So he clearly had the concept that the translation was uh, a volitional, uh, intellectual activity on Joseph's part, but we're not proposing that it be retranslated. Among other things, we don't have the original text, so how could we retranslate it? But uh, by understanding the translation in this way, we think that it uh, would be more approachable to uh, modern audiences in our 21st century audience than uh, the current stories, which are focused on the folk magic and the uh, uh, seerstone context of the Book of Mormon, which we believe is just superstition that it's in a historical record. We don't deny that, but we think that it's not really relevant and should be left behind uh, in appreciating why the Book of Mormon is the way it is. Let me invite people, our participants then, to go to the reactions uh, point on the bottom of the screen. To wave your hand if, uh, if our mentor is is with us, 
Deb has been watching keeping things in order. Um, I would like to get one more question in before I turn it over, though, uh, because as I remember, Jane Manning indicated that when she went through Lucy Max Smith's room in Nauvoo in the mansion house, that uh, Lucy volunteered her to carry a bundle and let her feel the urine thummum and told her that's what she was feeling. Any means of accounting for that? Uh, yes, uh, this is something we address in the book. So the term, uh, one of the reasons that in the book we tried to use the term interpreters, because the term Urim and Thummim is, is uh, it's, it's a problematic term. It's not the original term. The first time we see it is 1832. Um, and it came to be used more gent loosely than uh, just meaning the interpreters. And so one of the arguments of people who advocate the Searstone in the hat explanation is that anything that refers to where the Urim and Thummim is referred to, it could be either the interpreters or the uh, Searstones. Now, that's we address that in the book in detail. And our argument is that, yes, again, it is true that the term Urim and Thummim began to be used rather loosely uh, later on. But we go through the actual translation accounts themselves, and it, if you look at them closely, it becomes clear that when talking about the translation, there always was a distinction between the seer stone and the interpreters, even by those who advocate the seer stone. The greatest advocate of the seer stone in the hat was David Whitmer. But even he, and we have uh, uh, interviews with him from the 1880s, uh, even he used the term Yerm and Thummim only to refer to the interpreters, not, and he used, he referred to the uh, seer stone as a separate object. So um, what Lucy was probably using the term to refer to a seer stone, it had more than one seer stone, uh, and, uh, but, uh, that was a loose use that does exist, but we we argue, and I think we show try to show in the book the evidence that when it came to actually describing in translation, everyone always made that distinction between the inter the Urim and Thummim, and that term was only used to apply to the interpreters, and the Sir Stone was a separate object. Thank you. So that would be my uh, you know our, our view of why that was uh, uh, that particular incident you're describing. Okay, let's open the forum to the other questions then. Okay, we've got uh, four people so far, Stephen and then Ed. Go ahead, Stephen, please. Well, first of all, James, I wanted to thank you for giving me a ride from Salt Lake City to Logan, Utah. Uh, really appreciate hey. it. Mormon History Association. It was, <laughs> it, was, uh, it was a pleasant trip. I, was, I enjoyed uh, getting to know you. Yeah, and it was great to just kind of have preliminary discussions about your work that you are doing with Jonathan. I just have a couple questions. First of all, mm -hmm. um, what kind of response have you been getting from people? Now, what I find interesting is that there seems to be a, role, a lot of hostility to anybody that wants to bring in new and different ideas, whether it's geographic models of the Book of Mormon or looking at the perhaps there were two sets of plates as opposed to one set of plate. Um, and, and, and what I find so fascinating as an outsider is that I, I know you don't like to use the term naturalistic, but I do think that it, what you're presenting, what you and Jonathan are presenting is a more naturalistic, rational explanation of how the Book of Mormon is coming forth, that as an evangelical, it makes it much more accessible and less of a magical and occult-like, you know, using an occult uh, object to translate scripture, uh, is makes it the, the Book of Mormon very scary to outsiders. Um, so that's why I like the naturalistic, but I understand where you're coming from, because of course there is 90, I think your theory is 99% naturalistic and 1% supernatural, which I think makes more sense to me as, to, as, as opposed to a stone that has these words magically appear on it. Now we're talking about 99% supernatural and 1% naturalistic. Um, but I guess I, yeah, in my follow-up to that is one is your responses, uh, how, what you've been getting, but also how do you differentiate your view of using a cell phone analogy of the seer stone with Brad Wilcox also using a similar analogy of the, the seer stone as a type of uh, cell phone, if you will. Um, okay, thank you for those uh, questions. So first of all, uh, as far as the reactions that we're getting, uh, that I haven't been getting much, 
because we're just putting this out there. Um, it's in the hands of, uh, the manuscript is in the hands of publishers, but just barely. Uh, I um, presented another uh, piece of the book at the Mormon History Association, and I'm told that um, uh, it created some stir, but I never got any personal feedback to it. Uh, you, you might put that question to Jonathan, who has, of course, been out there and much more public than I have. Uh, of course, Jonathan has gotten uh, some hostile reaction, not so much on this, but on a lot of the other things that he's advocated. Um, so uh, we, uh, you know, we, we uh, so far, there hasn't been a lot of pushback on the particular theory that I just presented, mostly, but uh, most people haven't heard <laughs> this particular theory yet either. So, uh, so far, um, you know, uh, it's been quiet, but the storm, you know, there may be a the storm still coming. Um, so as far as the uh, Brad Wilcox, the uh, comparison, uh, what those what they are doing. Uh, so what has happened is that um, in the last years, um, there has been an effort on part of the LDS Church to you know try to open up the historical record and acknowledge the historical record and traditionally uh in the lds church there was not much acknowledgement of the seer stone accounts um so and they are in the historical record you know this is there's no question about that they're in the historical record so there was efforts to open up the uh historical record and acknowledge that there are these seer stone accounts uh we uh think that that has gone overboard, um, that, you know, the acknowledgement was made of the Searstone accounts, but nobody has dug into them to put them in context and test whether they're really reliable, which we tried to do in this book. And as I said, our conclusion is that they are not very reliable. But nonetheless, um, so in the LDS scholarly community, uh, there has been a kind of a consensus rise uh, which accepts the Searstone accounts. Um, and uh, so uh, the question, uh, so comparing the comparison to uh, cell phone, um, basically the issue is how could a little object produce uh, the text of the Book of Mormon? So I think that Brad Wilcox in making that analogy was now he was clearly referring to the Searstone because he's accepted the Searstone account and then we hope that after he reads our book he'll change his mind but <laughs> we'll see uh, but uh he, he, he uh, basically if you look at the video that is made of him advocating that he's saying um he's addressing the issue of how could the book of Mormon text come from something so small as a Searstone and um from our, you know, from the point of view of our argument, you could ask the same question about the Yerman Thumma. I mean, the spectacles were big, but they weren't that big. So how could the Book of Mormon text come from there? And in that case, the cell phone analogy works both ways. You know, I don't think that the Sir Stone is how it happened, but the analogy is useful in that it explains to a modern uh, person, a 21st century person, how it is that you get get this whole 500 plus page book text out of some small object and that was the point he was making and and you know i to the extent that uh the point goes to how could you get a big book out of a little object it's a fair analogy that he made he just um uh didn't have the benefit of reading our research yet to know that in fact he should have been talking about the year and thumb and the Nephite Charodite interpreters rather than the, the Searstone in making his analogy. So anyway, that's that's how I'd, I'd respond to that. Okay, um, Brian made a comment. Uh, he appreciates it. It was interesting and very good, James. That came from oh, thank Brian. You. Um, Ed Founts, go ahead, please. Uh, yes, this is a very interesting presentation, um, but I'll start to push back a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I don't find any problem at all with people getting confused about the interpreters and seer stones. Uh, if anything, 
uh, people today understand we live in a magnetic digital universe and being able to get the full text of the Encyclopedia Britannica is no problem. We've got readers, you know, you get it a sentence at a time, a word at a time, a page at a time. So that's really, uh, to me, I don't see any problem at all with that. But there are two aspects of your explanation that I wonder about. Number one, it's one thing to get the text of the golden plates. It's quite another thing to produce it as a Hebrew book of poetry where the order of the words and the precise words are so important. Um, one cannot just go quickly over chiasmus and, and all the various Hebraic um, forms that you find in the Book of Mormon, because if Joseph was concocting the Book of Mormon out of his interpretations of, of an impression that he had, the chances that he would have put those words in the order that they had to do to show the parallelisms, the chiasms, and all the other, I mean, there's like a hundred different Hebraic forms that are found in the Book of Mormon. Uh, there's no way he could have done that because he didn't know it. Uh, and and the, the uh, quote that you give from the uh, Doctrine and Covenants, I've, I've, I've thought about that a lot. Uh, you notice that uh, the instructions given to uh, Oliver didn't work. They were wrong, at least as far as Oliver was concerned. Study it out in his mind. Uh, what, what part of studying it out in his mind could he possibly have used to read the characters on the gold plate and then transcribe it into Hebrew poetry. He, and, and that's another uh, uh, thing I, I have a problem with. You say that uh, he had plenty of time to write the book. If Joseph had to study it out in his mind with, with all the, uh, the complexity and structure that you pointed out, uh, he, you were an attorney. Uh, I was an attorney for 50 years. I can tell you, I had a specialty. And when I wrote briefs for courts, I had to study it out in my mind. I would spend sometimes several days working out a point. Um, I, I don't think he, he, he couldn't possibly have had enough time to put this book in the format that he got. And, yeah. uh, the, the professor who uh, wants to uh, lead us along to eliminate the, um, to put it into more naturalistic uh, uh, context rather than supernatural, says he had to use the, uh, the uh, King James version of the Bible. But the problem is that the Scusin Skousen group uh, just reported within the last, I don't know, less than 10 years, that uh, that language, the modern early English language is a dead language at the time that Joseph wrote. And it would have been a dead language to the people who were reading it. But the only, yeah. the only party that could have given us, the one party or the one character that could have given us the proper contextual understanding of what's on the golden plates and put it into English language, you dismissed at the beginning by saying we put the three Nephites aside. They were the, they were the bridge between the Nephites and people who could speak English uh, living in the world at the time that, uh, or who could have produced the text that Joseph was shown in his iPad, whatever it was, um, mm -hmm. to, to give us this, this Book of Mormon. 
And right. to, re, to redo the book in terms of uh, language for uh, new groups of people, where we put it into uh, language that they would recognize, you would lose the most interesting and I would say compelling uh, testimony of the book that it was a Hebrew book, that it is a book that reflects yeah. the Hebrew poetry. And to me, that, that was the most amazing thing I got out of it when I did the work I did on yeah. it. Well, if, if, I, if I could, um, I'm actually agreeing with you about 80%. Um, uh, I, I probably did not articulate it very well, but our argument is that uh, one of the, uh, you know, we against, we don't believe that Joseph Smith wrote it. And we argue that one of the uh, uh, arguments against that is in fact, this complex structure and all of these Hebraic uh, language structures in the book. So I, we agree with you. I mean, I agree with you on that, that that is uh, a critical aspect of the book and, and one of the strong evidences that this was not invented by Joseph Smith. Um, what we're arguing is that, that the way that structure got carried through and the, the Hebrew language artifacts uh, got carried through into the English text was that that was how he got it from the Urim and Thummim. So you, yeah. you, you have in the structure of the Book of Mormon, this, it's a kind of a, it's an interesting, it's a double structure. On the one hand, there's lots of 1820s type of English. On the other hand, as you've pointed out, there's this substrata of Hebraic forms and poetry uh, that, that is, in English, but you know, in these odd word orders and so forth, just like you struck to explain. And yet, the English is the English of the 1820s. So uh, it's this, it's it's a double structure. Well, uh, we argue that it is, and you you know, I gave you the link. Go look at Jonathan's database. But the point is, is that it's um, it's got how do you account for this double structure? I mean, even if it was in early modern English. It's still in English, not Hebrew. So how is it that the, the Book of Mormon text, whether it's early modern English or 1820s English, how is it that it has this substrata of Hebraic forms and so forth that you described? So our explanation for that is that that's what Joseph was getting from the Urim and Thummim. The Urim and Thummim was giving him the uh, very literalistic uh, version of the text, and that he, um, you know, he rephrased a lot of it into language of his time, uh, which explains why the vocabulary all is from the 1820s. But he was, uh, you know, it flowed through the Hebraic structures flowed through because that's what he was working from. So we believe our explanation explains both these linguistic features of the Book of Mormon: the fact that the language is, uh, you know, a lot of it is from Joseph's environment, but there is this substrata of Hebraic language forms and so forth uh, that also uh, are found in this English text. Now, with regard to the um, early modern English, um, we deal with that in the book, address it at length. It's a bit of a convoluted argument and I'm, I'm uh, for purposes of this group because I see there's a few other people with questions. I'm gonna I'm gonna beg you uh, to to pass on that question. Uh, let me pass on that question and just refer you to the book when it comes out, and we address the early modern English arguments so we can get to some of the other folks. Uh, mm -hmm. But uh, you know your 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 uh, you know your suggestion that the Book of Mormon is is like is is at base a Hebrew book and that that can be seen in the English translation. We agree with you on that. Uh, that's, and we, we're just trying to explain how that happened, how you get this. Uh, uh, so that's, you know, our, our, we have a, a, our theory kind of accounts for that feature of the book, which is a very significant feature, uh, as you say, as you correctly point out. Okay, okay. thank you. Sure. Okay, I think uh, we can move on to next 
person. Okay. I think that's Sorry, me. It's Eric. Yeah, and then Rick. All right. I uh, want to say, first off, really enjoyed the presentation. Um, I, uh, myself, am currently in the, the process of creating a transliteration of the Book of Mormon into Hebrew using 6th century BC Hebrew, not a modern Hebrew. And uh, one of the things that I found early on was the wording in the Book of Mormon uh, adheres to the uh, prefixes and suffixes that you find in 6th century BC Hebrew uh, hmm. very, very closely. Uh, almost, I dare say, like 95, 98% of the time. Um, and so, you know, the ob observation I make is it's not that the Book of Mormon mimics the King James style. It's just that the King James being a formal translation of Hebrew, right. the Book of Mormon is also a formal translation of Hebrew. So in that respect, they sound the same because they're both formal translations of the underlying Hebrew. Okay, that, that's, that, that's a very reasonable point. So, so I think I I, I I think I would agree with you on that. Uh, and uh, but thank you. That's that's fascinating. And obviously, we're very I'd be very fascinated to see your uh, your project that you're just describing. At what at what point are you are you you know a far away from publication? Tend never to publish or I'm about a little over ninety six percent done with kind of the first draft, and okay. uh, I put it out there on. My website, it's bookofmormoninfo.com. Uh, you can you can see it there. About every month, I update it with the last you know previous month's worth of work. But it's getting close to the first draft. Okay, all right. Well, look, be very interested to see that. Thank you. Okay, uh, Rick, go ahead, please, and then Brian. Okay, thanks, James, for uh, for filling in and. Uh, you, uh, you have a, a great mastery of the English language. Um, uh, the question I have um, about what your presentation was, the Book of Mormon doesn't follow exactly the King James Version. And so I'm wondering if Joseph used the King James Version, why is, this, why is the Book of Mormon King James Version different than the King James Version version? Good, good, good question. And um, sort of overlaying, and I maybe didn't mention and emphasize this enough in my presentation, yeah. uh, but uh, overlaying the whole process was the guidance of the Holy Spirit. So uh, basically, our argument would be that Joseph and Oliver were tracking the King James, unless either the translation they were getting from the Yerman Thummim differed yeah. in some way or the Holy Spirit told them, you know, write it this way, uh, even though the, the King, your, your, your Bible, King James Bible is saying it differently. So okay. we would acknowledge that there, uh, and there were, as you, as you point out, there are in fact uh, differences. And uh, so that's how we would explain those differences as being so, part of this so you would uh, say inspired that, process. Yeah, so you would say the Isaiah in the Book of Mormon is more inspired or more accurate than the King than the Isaiah in King in the King James Bible itself, because um, yeah. of the additions that the Holy Spirit gave them. Well, let's put it this way: as to how close or not close it is to some old Hebrew text. I yep. don't know. That's not my area of expertise. Okay. It may be, as we learned from the fact that Joseph did his new Bible translation, it could be that um, it, that's how the original read and the Holy Spirit was telling Joseph, you know, write it a little differently Yeah. because even yeah. the original Hebrew is not the very best version of this revelation. Yeah. So that's another possibility. Okay, um, next question in uh, quotes that are recorded in the Book of Mormon from God or from Jesus. Did Joseph paraphrase those or did he get those quotes uh, word for word in English? 
Um, we uh, I, let's put it this way: our view is that if it's if it wasn't being if he wasn't tracking the King James Bible, yeah, and these are new words from Jesus or God, yeah, that what he was doing was he was getting the Nephite version of those sayings. In other words, the, those were <laughs> written down by the Nephite uh, authors in Nephite. And what he was getting, what Joseph was getting from the Urim and Thummim was yeah. a very literalistic translation of what the Nephites wrote yeah. of yeah. what they understood God and Jesus to have said. Right. So, so when uh, God speaks to Lehi and Nephi, um, if you keep my commandments, you'll prosper in the land. If you don't keep my commandments, you will be cut off from my presence. So that, that would have been an English translation of what God the Father or Jesus would have said in the Nephite tongue. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. Next is uh, no erasures. Uh, I'm sure you're probably familiar with no erasures in the Book of Mormon. Okay. Um, were they inserted by Joseph or were they inserted by the original writers and inscribers to correct something that would needed clarification? I'm afraid now you're 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 going beyond my own personal expertise. So I'm I okay. To, we, we you know our 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 theory is we're we're presenting a theory for the first time, and I'm sure yep. that if people are attracted to it, that there will be a lot of elaborations, and that would be a point that yeah. might uh, be studied further. Yeah, I, I just had it, heard it explained that when the inscribers were. Uh, putting the words down on the on the plates and they said oh it really doesn't sound right um, I need to uh, clarify you know their secret parts being shielded um, that they they're going to add more information but if Joseph is writing it down he wouldn't really need to to put those in there because he could have fixed it in the transcribing process uh, you know? well I, I uh, okay this is not something we really get into that level of okay. detail in our we'll skip book, that but one then. no, but I, I would say that I my I, my suspicion since those things do appear in the Book of Mormon, you know, in other words, that I suspect that the the, the Yerman Thummim were giving him that text as a you know it was just translating what it was on the gold yeah. plates, and Joseph yeah. was just. You know, he was taking it the way that it was the Yerman Thumb was giving it to him. Okay. You know, trying to turn it into 1820s English, but mainly yeah. uh, he was putting down what the gold plates said. Okay. He was tracking um, the gold plates. Right, right. Um, you know, we, uh, I mentioned about Isaiah not being a, a word for word with King James. Um, Malachi also, um, the Malachi in the Book of Mormon is different than the Malachi in the King James Bible. Um, yeah. Um, but anyway, uh, the interpreters that were either uh, that that the brother Jared got to include with his bundle of plates or mm -hmm. his writings, he was supposed to include them, um, the interpreters. Um, do you have a theory as to who made those? Well, um, it's, uh, you know, in the account in the book of Ether, it's yeah. sort of a wondrous thing that, yeah. you know, he receives these. But yeah. we would we would we would um, we would suggest suggest the analogy to again to technology, you know the the belief in uh, in I think all the restoration traditions is that God is a uh, the master engineer of the universe. He uh, understands all laws. He acts and and works in accordance with all laws. So we would suggest that however the interpreters were produced, however they were manufactured, uh, yeah. to use modern terminology, it was, you know, a divine uh, process that used the laws of nature. And that's why we uh, feel it's comfortable. Well, uh, you know, quite certain that the interpreters were, you know, I, we compare them to modern technology, but I'm sure that they are far beyond our technology that we know, but we feel comfortable making the anal comparison because um, of this, you know, understanding then the restoration that God is the master and, you know, architect of the universe and, and he does things that work according to the physical laws of the universe. 
And so yeah, I, I was just wondering you were you were talking about the interpreters being like of Joseph Smith era, or maybe um, you know um, earlier on, you know when when the the twenty four plates are translated or the stone that Coriantumr brought. Um, but if if they're the same interpreters, then they had a much earlier origin. Oh, yes. Oh yes. Yes. Okay. If 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 you uh, you know if if in fact. Uh, and I think this is the best interpretation. Those objects that were in the box with the gold plates were the original interpreters that were given yeah. to the first American prophets. Yeah. They were much older than the gold plates. They're the yeah. true, truly ancient artifact that Joseph was given uh, by yeah. Moroni. Okay. Yeah. Thank you for your, your time and presenting to us. And uh, thank you for your work. Thank you. Thanks, Rick. Okay, Brian and then Frank. Go ahead, Brian. Hey, first of all, very good, James. I enjoyed that. In fact, I have thought many of the same thoughts over the years. Um, just two points. One is I, mm -hmm. I used to work for the translation department when I was a grad student at U of U as a part-time job, and it was fun and interesting. And uh, and I find your words on uh, translation of Isaiah interesting because because yes, that what you said uh, helps make a little more sense because the uh, King James Version was the esteemed text of the day. Uh, one thing I've always been bothered by is the verse in Second Nephi chapter twelve, verse nine, which uh, uh, corresponds to Second Isaiah chapter two, verse nine: "The mean man boweth not down, and the great man humbleth himself not." Um, in the Hebrew, that is the mean man just is ish. It's just one word. It means a common man. So the mean mm -hmm. doesn't really mean mean, as in vicious and violent. It means the common man. And the great man mm -hmm. is the, actually the mean man is Adam, a lower level, lower class. So these are talking about two different classes of men: a common man and the upper class man. So. Adam and Ish, the Hebrew simply uses two different words for man. The uh, Spanish Isaiah does an excellent job of translating that in using hombre for the first one and baron, baron, uh, for the second one, a, a little higher class. So it uses two different words for man. It conveys really nicely that we have a common man and a higher, a man of a higher class. Um, but but in the uh, Spanish of the Book of Mormon, we have uh, el hombre vil, the vile man for the mean man. And so, um, you know, there's there's a lot of work that needs to be done. And I mean, when you when you look at the Hebrew, the 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 translation from the Hebrew to the King James version, and then the, the Book of Mormon. Uh, corresponds to a degree to the King James, and then you translate that into Spanish. The Spanish of the Bible and the Spanish of the Book of Mormon are four translations removed. And, it, and uh, I actually sent a letter to the translation department 30 years after I worked there to explain that it might be good to just kind of look at the, because the Spanish translation, for that particular verse anyway, is, is wonderful. Whereas we're, we kind of messed up the English translation. So yeah, a lot of work to be done in those areas yet. And, and I really appreciated your words. One more thought is that uh, the idea that it was a combination of thinking, as you mentioned, through things, as well as uh, seeing or receiving a, or, or confirmation of best wording or whatever. I also found interesting because I often looked at Joseph Smith's experience. He received uh, the plates in 1827 and the translation was completed in 1829. And, uh, and even though there was some translation that happened, uh, as, as is noted, you know, most of the translation happened in the last, uh, what, two or three months, most mm -hmm. of it, you know. Mm -hmm. But, uh, and so he had the plates for most of two years and it might have been like our typical missionaries i mean he's he was a missionary age basically 
And mm-hmm. maybe he was given that time to study it and learn the language. It's just like a missionary today. It takes a couple of years to learn the language that he deals with or must deal with shortly. And so he was, he might have been, uh, and, and he tutored by Moroni frequently. So he might have been studying the language of those plates so that he could read them to a degree. And again, with help from the spirit and whatever. So uh, every, everything you said, I found very interesting and, and compatible. and. Uh, and very good. I don't really have any questions. I just wanted to add those couple of comments. I'll just um, add one comment to the point you just made. I mean, Joseph did himself say in his one of his accounts that the first thing he did was to use the Yerman Thurman to copy out characters. And that's where the Martin Harris document came from, was Joseph uh, did use the Yerman Thurman. He says that he used it to translate some of the characters um, and that uh, that was uh, uh, one of his first activities that he did. So there's actually uh, historical record uh, evidence that he was kind of trying to start with to uh, learn the basics, at least, of uh, understanding the, the uh, Nephite characters. Uh, so you, that account is in our book, so you can uh, you can see the reference yeah. to that when it's in our, when, you, when our book comes. Anyway, very interesting. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Brian. Frank Fry, you're next. Yeah, myself unmuted here. Uh, first of all, <clears throat> before I go into the couple of comments that I want to make, thank you. I apologize again for getting here late. Uh, I enjoyed what I, I heard. Um, before I forget here, Rick, you asked about the no erasures and that I think uh, I, I would agree with uh, what James is saying here that the no erasures were were mistakes that were on the plates. You can't erase something that's on a metal plate. And so they had to make some kind of correction or start another plate. They had that choice and they chose not to. <clears throat> uh, so I, I don't have a problem with those at all. Uh, then there's, I've got about three or four things here. I just want to comment on, um, how do you get something that big out of something that small talking about, you know, uh, the book of Mormon out of those stones? Well, I don't, first of all, I don't think that they book of Mormon came from those stones. It was a medium that the Lord used to, uh, give the message of the book of Mormon to him. Um, <clears throat> talking about something small I used to have and I can still probably buy another one I, I saw it recently on the internet a one inch square piece of microfilm that had the entire King James Bible on it and you could only read it with a microscope and I, I looked at it many times under my little microscope and and you could read every word of it uh, clear as a bell so you can get you know a lot of small things uh, mm-hmm magnified into big things uh and then there was a a, the prophet in the book and the bible that uh, sent a prophetic message to the king and he burned it and the bible says that uh the prophet rewrote the message and and the lord added more to it so i don't have a problem with that either Mm -hmm. um the simplest answer in my opinion is the fact that you know we were told that it was translated by the gift and power of God. And I think that's the simplest answer and, and the best answer. It was done by the gift and power of God. Uh, I don't think that Joseph Smith uh, did a lot of um, analysis of the words. I think they were given to him. Um, I think that there, there were many changes in the in the uh, between the 1830 edition and the next edition of the Book of Mormon. A lot of those were scribal errors, and many of those still haven't been corrected. Uh, I've been studying a lot about the translation of the King James Bible recently, and it took three editions to get most of the of the errors uh, from the type typographers the guys that were setting the, the type the printers the printers the, the yeah. printers it took at least three editions of it to get most of them out and there's there's one, at least one that i know of that is still there but uh 
uh, not a big deal. I mean, we know what it's supposed to say. <laughs> Mm -hmm. And and there there's still things in the Book of Mormon. You know, there's one place where it says that uh, in, in Nephi, where he has a vision and he sees into the future, when the Lord comes, there's a great destruction. And uh, he, I've, I've mentioned this on here before, but the the fact is, it says that by Nephi, it says those who had fallen were the ones that saw the Lord when he came. You know. And then when you get over to third Nephi, where it describes the exact occurrence, uh, it repeats the language almost, not exactly, but almost. And it says those who had not fallen were the ones who saw the Lord. And that just uh, makes it very clear that it was a, uh, a natural volcanic event where if you'd fallen down, uh, you would have been suffocated. And that very kind of thing has happened in, in other places of the world. There was a place in Africa where that happened. And it's been speculated that's why the firstborn of Egypt uh, died, be, why they died, because they were laying on the ground and, and the parents were, or the others were lay, laying in beds that were up off the floor. Uh, yeah, I don't know whether that's true or not. I, I kind of doubt that. But it is a fact that there were hundreds of people who died during a volcanic type event uh, because they were sleeping on the ground. Anyway, thank you for your, your presentation again and, and, and enjoyed what I got to hear. Okay. I understand these are recorded, so you can go back and listen to the full recording. I, that Robert I do that. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Thanks. Jonathan, looks like you're next. Thanks for your patience. Okay, I, I just made a note here on that, uh, the question about, in other words, that's one of those non-biblical Edwardsian, Jonathan Edwards phrases that he used over a hundred times in his work. And, and it's interesting because the way Jonathan Edwards used it was he would say something and then he would say, in other words, or in other words, and re-say it slightly differently. It wasn't because he was correcting himself. It was because he was providing another explanation of the concept he was trying to say. And, and so when I see that in the Book of Mormon, to me, that's Joseph Smith struggling with what's the best way to say this. Here's one way or in other words, here's another way. And, and you know, that's I, how I see it. Uh, you, you're uh, talking about something that I just said. I'd like to respond to that. Yeah. Some of those that we call no erasures are completely reversed. Mm -hmm. uh, so it wasn't a matter of him trying to figure out how to say it. He made a mistake and he's trying to correct it. <laughs> well, and that's the same thing because they were taking in the process of translating, he could correct mistakes as he was going, but his scribes are recording everything verbatim. Oh, and I see so, what you're saying. Yeah. So okay. whether it was, he was correcting his translation or, expressing in another way. To me, those are both evidence of him actually translating an, an ancient record. So that, I, I don't need to say much more. I have a whole bunch of notes here. <laughs> but I just wanted to bring that up because, you know, in, in the context of how Jonathan Edwards' terminology and use of the language appears so often. And that's one of the really interesting examples because it, Joseph actually used that phrase more in the Doctrine and Covenants than he did in the Book of Mormon, which is another interesting concept. Because he was, in, in fact, I, I pulled it up here just as a, um, an example. That phrase, in other words, appears 13 times in the Book of Mormon, but 23 times in the Doctrine and Covenants. So to me, that's a, another indication that it was his way of expressing how he was trying to articulate the word of God in his mind. So, In anyway. the Book of Mormon, there's more of those that are where they use the, the word or and or rather. Yeah. Yeah. I, well, I didn't I didn't pull those up, but just the phrase in other words. Okay. And it's is more common in the Doctrine and Covenants. In fact, I think it's even in Joseph Smith history he used that phrase. Yeah, I don't consider a lot of those corrections. I, I consider those right. that's a different issue in my mind. Thank you anyway. Yeah. And it, and it's nowhere in the Bible. So okay. Anyway, that's enough. <laughs> okay, thank you. David DeBarth, you're next, and then Richard. Thank you, James. As a lifetime member of the Community of Christ and 
with secular training in science and a career in science, I like it. I think it gives us a wonderful foundation for continued study and research and, and exploration. Uh, I love that. Carry on, brother. Well done. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, David. Richard, go ahead, please. You were mentioning to James Lucas. Mm -hmm. You were talking. Richard, are you there? I'm here. OK, go ahead, please. <clears throat> Uh, back in the 70s, there was some uh, uh, linguistic analyses uh, that uh, were identified as word prints. And when applied to the Book of Mormon, uh, this technique uh, concluded that the uh, quoted text within each uh, contributor's uh, section of the book uh, represented a unique individual. And even the very, very shortest of uh, books um, uh, indicated that they were uh, not the major speakers like Nephi, Lehi, so on and so forth. Anyway, uh, the first thing I would look at if I had a copy of your book in hand would be to see if there's any um, evidence that was presented back then in your understanding of the translation? Well, um, we don't discuss the word prints in the book. It's a, you know, it's a short book and it tries to get through a lot of material, um, but we also try to keep it fairly short and accessible. So we don't really address the issue of word prints because word prints are a very complicated issue because of course, I'm familiar with what you're referring to about the word print analysis of the Book of Mormon, but of course there's been people who've attacked that and said that the word print analyses that uh, were done on the Book of Mormon that proved that it was multiple authors were you know, not properly done and so on and so forth. So we kind of stepped away. Uh, we just did not get into that particular issue. But the idea that the Book of Mormon contains different voices you don't, um, I think that's evident even without word prints. I mean, you, you just read it as a, and there are uh, literary analysis at literary analysts, analysts, there we go, who have studied the Book of Mormon and published books who speak about just from the literary style of the various authors, how distinctive Nephi is from Mormon and, you know, Enos is from Moroni and so forth. Uh, without referring to the word print studies. And I think, you know, those are very valid, uh, you know, uh, points uh, that those uh, literary critics have made. Uh, just pointing out, I mean, just as a, a very amateur person, uh, it was uh, obvious to me, even the very first time that I read the Book of Mormon, that, you know, Nephi was a very different kind of writer than Mormon. Uh, and I think that, uh, you know, anybody who's reading the text, uh, will immediately see that they're, they're, they're hearing different uh, people uh, uh, talk and have, uh, they have very different approaches to things. Uh, so I think that, and our, our, in our theory, that uh, the explanation as to how, why that carries through into the translated English text would be that um, Joseph was getting this very literalistic uh, uh, translation from the Urim and Thummim that would preserve these idiosyncrasies of the various authors and that carried through into his, uh, his restatement of uh, the, the, their words in, uh, in his translation. Thank you. Yep, thank you. Okay, we have Ed and then Frank. Go ahead, please, Ed. Yes, um, I forgot to mention one thing. Uh, when uh, you quoted the uh, section nine of the Doctrine and Covenants on uh, instructions to Oliver if he was going to translate, um, one of the one of the uh, other sections of the Doctrine and Covenants, however, <clears throat> puts a a nuance on that because uh, after Joseph uh, 
had the experience of losing 116 pages. He was told he lost his gift. Uh, if his gift could be exercised by his um, studying it out in his mind, of course, he goes on to say, you have to ask me if it's correct. But apparently, he even lost the gift of being able to study it out in his mind. Now, if he knew the language, if he taught it to himself in the two years that he had access to Moroni, and the, but he didn't really have access to the place. I don't believe for that entire time. Uh, that, that's, a, that's a nuance to this whole thing of studying it out in your mind. See, here's my problem. I am afraid that in the long run, the more we try to give Joseph's mind, the more we try to identify what contemporary language he was using the less his role as a prophet bringing forth the word of God. I, I just see that as diminishing it. And that's why I, I have those problems. Anyway, I just wanted to mention that. Okay. I mean, that's, that, that's a, that's a, you know, that's a fair point. Um, I think our response, or at least my response to that would be that, um, I don't see uh, looking at Joseph's role in uh, uh, doing his translate, you know, uh, the in translation being an intellectual task that he was given by the Lord to be diminishing his role. Because if you look at the history of God's interaction with humanity, uh, God is always speaking through prophets and the personality and the uh, per, uh, talents and not lack of talents of the prophets very clearly factor into how they fulfill their missions. So I don't see, uh, you know, Joseph being an actively engaged translator as uh, diminishing him in, in comparison to Moses or Peter or Mormon who clearly also brought their personalities to the missions that God gave them. And, uh, you know, that impacted on how they fulfilled the missions that God uh, uh, gave them. So that would be sort of, uh, you know, that's how I would I'd respond to your concern, which I acknowledge is a, is a valid concern. And I understand your concern, but that's, that's how I would respond to that. Okay, but I, I wouldn't, I wasn't concerned that it would diminish Joseph's standing. Joseph at one time said that the Book of Mormon was words to the effect of the most perfect book in the English language. Uh, what, he, what I think he was really trying to indicate was, hey, folks, I didn't write this book. This book was given to me. And it was given to me by the gift and power of God. Um, if he had said, well, you know, I made this up as best I could, I used my mind and so forth, people could be much more skeptical of it. And uh -huh. that's, why, that's why I think the bridge between the plates and the translation that was given to Joseph has got to include the three Nephites. After all, when in third Nephi, G Jesus is talking to the man Nephi, the apostle or a disciple, he was called. Mm -hmm. And he says, didn't I tell you to put such and such in there? And he said, yes. He says, where is it? Oops. And he said, you yeah, he, they, left out, they left out the left out Samuel the Lamanite. They left out Samuel the Lamanite. It's the specific reference here. The yes, resurrection right. that he yes. prophesied. Yes. Yeah. So we right. know. I mean, but you're absolutely right. I, you said God works, uh, Jesus or God works through men mm -hmm. but, but here we have actual men who asked to be uh, allowed to continue living because they said they wanted to bring their words to their descendants and when mm -hmm. you put those aside say, well, we're not going to deal with those those are the very people that have the capability to both extract the meaning from the gold plate and to put it into English because they were alive and they had the capacity to learn that. And how can we put them aside? There's nobody else. 
So um, actually, I, I will make this point, and this is a much more elaborate discussion than we could probably uh, want to get into on this uh, Zoom call. But Jonathan and I actually are big thir three Nephite fans. Um, we don't believe that they translated the Book of Mormon, but we do believe they were actively present in the New York, uh, helping out with the translation, uh, you know, the Joseph's project or, you know, the translation project. We don't think they were the translators, but um, there are uh, several accounts. Like for example, uh, there's a very famous account when uh, uh, David Whitner has gone to Harmony to collect Joseph and Oliver, and they're going up to Fayette, New York to finish the translation. And David has described to many people an incident that happened where they came across a stranger on the road as they were riding along the road on a buggy to go from Harmony to Fayette. And they stopped and the stranger was an elderly man uh, they described with a knapsack on his back. And they offered him a ride. And the man said, um, thank you, but I'm going to Kimura. And David Whitmer, this struck him because it was the first time he'd ever heard the term Kimura. And he retold this story many times to many people. And uh, it's left out of modern accounts because, of course, the uh, people don't like to identify the hill in New York as the hill of Kimura. But uh, uh, so they then the gentleman kind of disappeared. And, uh, you know, David and Oliver turned to Joseph and said, well, who is that? And Joseph said, that's one of the three Nephites. Um, he's carrying the plates and he was carrying the plates in his knapsack to take them back to the Hill Cumorah. And uh, so uh, later, when uh, you recall the incident when Mary Whitmer is shown the uh, plates uh, in the um, in later accounts, they changed it to say Moroni, but in the early accounts, Mary Whitmer said the man introduced himself as Brother Nephi. And in his descriptions of the accounts, David Whitmer uh, always identified the man who came to see his mother as being the same man they had encountered on the road to uh, Fayette and uh, said that, uh, you know, that was uh, Nephi of the three Nephites. So uh, we actually uh, strongly believe that uh, uh, the three Nephites were tasked with the helping out with this whole project. You know, Moroni was this angel resurrected being who could only, you know, who appeared in light and, and wonders and so forth. But, you know, who carried the plates around, who got the, you know, went from here to there and, and uh, ran, you know, basically uh, engaged in all of this physical labor, well, we believe it was the three Nephites, that they were around and carrying out tasks uh, to help out with the whole project of getting the Book of Mormon translated. So while we disagree that they were translators, we do agree very strongly that they were present in the 1820s period and helping out uh, very actively with the uh, whole project of getting the Book of Mormon going. So that's, yeah. a, that's a different subject, but it's... Uh, uh, you know, I just point that out that uh, uh, well, that that's they were, uh, they were not only present in the 1820s when the Book of Mormon was being produced or just before it was, but they were also present uh, on this earth in the 15th and 16th centuries when uh, the English was early modern English. That, that, <laughs> that, that, that's the inescapable fact that's missing. Oh. Well, th that they were around, no doubt, you're correct, that they translated the Book of Mormon into early modern English. Like I said, I I'd have to ask you to defer that discussion to the book and okay. we address all that in the book. But, but we agree with you that the three Nephites were around and active and, and uh, carried out important tasks in connection with the uh, Book of Mormon. So that, on that point, we can agree. Mm -hmm. Well, I've tried, I've tried to figure out who it could be, but I don't know anybody who lived in the, who, who were actual alive in both of those time periods. I don't know anybody else, so anyway. Okay, well, if you're- I'll you wait know, for I, I guess I, <laughs> okay. But we, 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 uh, we, we uh, 
We're forming a three-day fights fan club, and you're welcome to join. <laughs> um, okay. Okay, Frank, go ahead, please. I'll join that fan club too. <laughs> okay. I, I believe Good. they've been a, been active uh, right up to the present here. I just wanted to share a, a testimony, a personal testimony. I've been involved with uh, uh, the translation of the Book of Mormon in two different languages now, and and uh, I've translated many many other materials in one of those languages. Um, <clears throat> And as, as I was working with some men over in Kenya uh, with the Book of Mormon and in, into Swahili, I can't remember exactly where it was when I got to that point, but it, somewhere in the middle of the book, I, I suddenly the realization came to me and, and I, my major was in Spanish and language and language uh, uh, linguistics and, and uh, the teaching of, of second language. Um, but it, it really came to my consciousness very, very uh, strongly at a certain point when we're about halfway through or so that this book was not what, we, what we're looking at in English and trying to struggle to put in another language. That wasn't the original language that that book was printed in mm -hmm. because it wasn't wasn't our our current english it was not just joseph smith's english i, I know enough about the king james bible and and our our inspired version was based on that king james bible so but uh it, it was just impressed on me very strongly that that this book was not written in english I mean, it, there's been all kinds of people have tried to say, well, somebody just invented this in the 19th century. They didn't do that because the, the struggle with the words, trying to put them in the proper format so that we might understand them. There's a, there's a process in your mind when you're trying to translate something. And I do that all the time with Spanish, mm -hmm. but there I was trying to do it again with Swahili and not that I learned a lot of Swahili, but I saw the process that these men were going through and I watched it and I saw the words as they were being uh, formed and the sentences being formed. And, and I realized this was not written in, in our language, in, in English, it was written in another language. And we're the benefactors of that in, in our language, but it, it was a struggle to get it there anyway. No, thank, thank you for that testimony, because, you know, we completely agree with that. Um, to account for the Book of Mormon, um, you, you have to, um, you know, it, it has, it's, it's the, on the surface, it's written in 1820s English, but it has the substrata of ancient forms, Hebraic uh, poetry, and just rich uh, right complexity that uh, you you simply can't account for why the Book of Mormon is the way it is unless you can account for how that uh, substrata of ancient language artifacts flowed through into the English text. And so that's what we hope one of the things we were trying to do with coming up with our approach was to uh, take that into account, which uh, um, obviously the composition uh, uh, advocates, they just ignore that. They just ignore that, even though yeah. there's many, many people who've explored and explained this substrata of ancient language artifacts that you're you're discussing uh, uh, are uh, flow through our, our our parent in the Book of Mormon, even in the English translated English text. Yes, absolutely. Thank you. Okay, looks like Nancy and her brother have been sitting there waving their hands like crazy. So go oh ahead. Oh my Nancy. goodness. <laughs> You have to unmute. Got to unmute. We're playing charades now. <laughs> I can't even see them. Oh, so can I'm, can I'm... you un unmute to her? No. 
you okay so that can't nancy can only, they can't they can't can unmute you to unmute i cannot unmute them okay so i guess can you she's, type it in the chat no you can't because you ain't at the computer never mind yeah apparently they can't get to the computer or something or may may not be able to maybe they're looking at it on this from a projected image on the ceiling or something i don't know <laughs> We appreciate your efforts. <laughs> okay, and, keep trying. Paul, I guess uh, uh, I'm not. Oh, I need to sign off. Jonathan, thanks for joining us. It was great to have hey, you. With us. We're thanks, talking buddy. about it. Nancy. Oh, all right, there we go. Hey, sorry about that. Uh, uh, modern technology is wonderful. <laughs> okay. Um, well, on the same theme that Frank was uh, talking about, about different languages and trying to go from one to the other. We also have to keep recognizing that, yes, this was in a Hebrew language they were using, but they were using Egyptian script. Correct. So another it more complicated. To make yep. it even more yes. complicated. Right. right. Yes, yes, so yes. We have to keep that in mind that, that, that there are so many layers here. It's, it's a real complicated deal. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, I just wanted to ask you, uh, James, to please repeat the name of your book, because I want to get it when it comes out. OK, it's um, uh, where does the Book of Mormon come from? Question mark. A neo-Orthodox view of its origins, translation and destiny. Actually, I should uh, maybe write that in the chat if uh, let's see. Uh, so I'm not a fast typist, but that's what it is. And Thank you. Now, it could be, we, we don't have a publisher yet, so it could be they'll come up with some other title, but this is what we're starting it with. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Whoops. Okay. Thanks for joining us, Nathan. It was good to have you. And I really, really appreciate this. It was uh, a lot of things made so much sense. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Well, we hope that uh, I hope a lot of other folks. Uh, oh, here we go. I see. I'm going to finish typing it out in the chat here. Um, thank you. I hope that a lot of other people also find it uh, uh, convincing and useful. Oh, okay, where's the uh, Okay. We are beyond 10:15. Let me sing us out and invite people to continue afterwards. The Lord is blessing me right now, right now. I feel him right now in my soul. I may not be able to see what the Lord has, but I know blessing me right now. Good night to all of you that leave early and I want to continue to discuss. Good night. James, James Good night, Paul. I think you have to hit enter on your on your chat. It hasn't shown up in the chat yet. Uh, I've not finished typing it. Oh, good reason. 